at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, Hi contact everyone. your AIA uh, CDM welcome today. to uh, XY Live for this week. Uh, this week we're very lucky to have Lee Chevelle who joined us for the very first XY Live back many moons ago. Uh, and today we're talking to Lee about, uh, about her business but in, about her uh, online coaching course that she's uh, online financial advice and wellness course that that she's put together recently um just wanted to say uh, firstly a big thank you to our partners uh aia uh for, for uh supporting this event and, and making these things possible um and for everyone watching in uh, there's a chat box on the right hand side uh feel free to write any questions that you've got for lee into the box and we're going to come to them as we go through the session. So Lee, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Um, and firstly, thanks for you, having me. Oh, no, always a pleasure. Uh, and can you just tell us a bit about your business? Give us a bit of background. So my business is called Wealthy um, and I specialise in financial wellbeing for women particularly. So that's through teaching them through online coaching, but also face to face. I still do financial planning, um, less around the investment side, but more around strategic um, advice at the stage. Um, what else can I take you? It's been, I was a partner in MHP Private Wealth, but I've just now switched my license across to Wealthy, so sole director of this company. I have one full-time staff member and four interns working for me presently. Awesome, and I know that uh, you've got a big focus on 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 overall wellness uh, as incorporated into into financial advice. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, that evolved over studying to be a yoga teacher, but also just from interacting with my clients and finding that more and more of them were coming to me saying that they wanted to talk about money, when in reality, they wanted to talk about their lives and they wanted to understand how to use the money that they have in their lives to achieve the goals that they want to achieve and to live happier and more fulfilled lives. And the conversations that I was having with them was a lot more to do with well-being than it was to do just about money. So that kind of was the catalyst for me to create a program that is more focused on well-being and understanding how to use this resource that we all have in our lives and that we all have an really interesting relationship with, how to use that in a way to create better fulfilled and, and more purposeful lives, I guess. Awesome. So I know we, we spoke a lot about that in, in, the, in the, last, the last time we did one of these sessions, but uh, clearly an interesting space and one that's growing. And I, and I, from talking to you, I think that's, that's what sort of led to uh, this online course that you, that you recently created. Can you just tell us a bit more about how that all came about and, and what it actually covers and what it is? So I created um, my course it's called the Mindful Wealth Movement and I created it as a movement. So my idea was that I want to start coaching one to many. So if I really want to have, make a difference in the world and get my message out there and help more people, then it needs to be on a one to many basis rather than a one to one basis. Mm. And I thought, well, there's two ways I can do that. I can um, you know, write a book or I can do an online course or, and I can start talking and doing lots of public speaking and traveling. And, and I'm doing all of those things, but I think the online course for me was, um, I guess that's a matter of the passion because I am a lover of, of online learning and I thought well maybe I could create something that's interactive and engaging and people can do in their own time and something a little bit different from the normal there's a lot of research out there to say that around 47 percent of women are too scared to go see a financial planner or they also find about 38 percent find dealing with money really boring so those were sort of two key metrics that made me think well how can I how can I really engage with those people what can I do to to, you know resonate with them and how can I communicate with them differently from what's been currently done um, so that's the kind of the drivers to, as to why I created an online course um, I think looking back now I didn't realize how much work it would be and I also didn't I, I think I was just like yeah I'll do it 
and I'm one of those people that start something and then like a dog with a bone, I've got to see it through. But it, it really took a pound of flesh. I can <laughs> tell you that. Yeah. To yeah. Um, Lee, I might just jump in here. Um, you were saying then that um, that you decided to create the online course because it was a way of, uh, I suppose, reaching people at scale, so more people than you could service face to face. Um, does that mean that the level of touch between those people is lower than you would you know, in your traditional advice relationship? Uh, is it now like a level of touch in your cost? Is that the way the course is designed, or is there varying levels of um, of engagement or uh, with, with the clients? So that's a really interesting question. Um, we've just changed the model to have two different styles. So we've got like a do-it-yourself style where people can just jump in, they get access to all the material um, and they can just do it themselves. The other style is more accountability. So that's where there's a weekly webinar, they can contact me at any time. So the program that we're using online, they can tag different parts of the content with questions and then we go in and answer their questions for them to make it more of a personalized journey. And then we have once a week webinars where we just answer any questions that they might have in regards to their own situation. But it was definitely designed less as um, advice and more as this is a precursor to get someone in the right mindset to go and seek advice. So a bit like the um, like the first step, like a non-threatening way for them to experience your value before they take the next escalation point, I suppose, into face-to-face. And is there an option in the course across that um, period while they're doing the online course to meet you face-to-face or after the course is completed? So at the end of the program, um, I encourage them to seek advice at no matter, and I give them a whole lot of options, going to see a money coach, going to see a financial planner. Um, and my idea is that as I become busier, then I'll have a panel, panel of advisors that I can then promote them to. That's sort of the concept that I want, because obviously I don't and don't envisage myself being able to work one-on-one -on -one with everybody. And I also want to make sure that um, I do partner them with people um, that that they resonate with. So I'm really keen for it to be a precursor for every advice relationship. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Okay, cool. Cool. And so Lee, can you just step us through like what's actually covered in the program? Yeah, definitely. So a lot of what I do um, in the program is that precursor to seeing advice. So I was finding that a lot of clients are coming to me without a real understanding of you know, what is money to them in their lives? What are their values? What are the goals that they're trying to achieve? How much debt do they actually have? Do they know where their super is? Do they have a budget? Do they have a spending plan? All of those, what I would say would be basic um, elements of, of you know getting your financial sorted a lot of my clients just didn't have that in progress so i thought well rather than me having to work with them one-on-one -on -one, why don't i create a course that kind of gets them financially financially fit or financially well and ready and engaged and driven to see a financial planner so it's kind of that pre pre-meeting element if you like and i'm yep. just creating um, a client base of people who have a good mindset, have healthy financial habits, have their stuff sorted, and they have a really clear direction on the goals and the decisions that they want to make financially so that then they sort of say to me, okay, Lee, now I'm ready to plan. Now I know what my spending's like. Now let's go and, and do this. Awesome. Sorry, and for everyone watching in, we're uh, we've managed to grab Lee at the airport when she when she's off to uh, to some jaunt. So uh, thank you for bearing with us with a with a bit of background noise there. Um, so just with the in terms of the, the the program itself, how how is how does it work? Is it it's uh, there's is it like a slideshow? Is it are there videos? Um, is there resources that go along with that? What's the journey for someone going through it? How long does it take? Uh, and what does it cost? So the program itself is six weeks um, and it's drip fed. So they get a content every week and then at the end of the six weeks they have full access to the content for a lifetime. 
Um, the, con the way that I've done it is I've used a membership platform, which is WordPress based. Um, they basically log into a membership area and then they have access to the full range of content. There are videos that we've got professionally shot. There's a whole lot of workbook materials, downloadable um, information. I've put in some TED Talks and things in there. So it's not all my own material, um, but I have sourced a lot. And then there's a resource library and a chat function and a lot of functionality in there as well. Um, in terms of cost, it's 297 to do the program. Um, and because we are a, a, a social enterprise, for every person who comes through the program, we grant a scholarship for another person who can't afford to do it. Um, yeah. And I really did that to make it accessible. I feel that there's such a need for people who don't necessarily feel like they can afford financial advice or financial literacy to seek it. Um, and, and to yeah, cool. So, look, I'm and I'm. We, I know we were chatting about this just before, and I'm keen to sort of, to sort of explore that a bit more. But just before we move on to the the whole um, sort of buy buy one give one thing, I know we everyone loves talking tech here. So you mentioned that your um, your site is a WordPress membership based site. Is that is that right? Is it is there a program that sits on top of that, or what are some of the key tech tools that you've used for the creation of this course? Yeah. So getting that right was quite hard. We looked and did a lot of research and um, I was going to use Kajabi and that was right up until sort of a month before we launched and then the theme that I wanted to use wasn't mobile friendly. Well, it just didn't come up really well on a mobile um, and that sort of made me think, well, that's not going to be a great idea. So we went and switched at the last minute to, it's called Access Ally or Access Alley, I'm not sure how to sell it, say it, but it's a, um, a membership hosting WordPress site. Um, we then had to get a coder to create the template to, for the look and feel of, of the actual course content material. So that was quite a big process. Um, and then we have at the back of that, we use um, Entreport as, as, I guess, the database, the membership, which um, allows and tags and sends out the emails and... Okay, cool. And and so, um, what? So, just in in relation to the 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 tech side of things, how did you like? How did you draw on support to get that? Like, where did you? How did you figure all this stuff out? Yeah, just before um you answer, Lee, I was going to say where like if if an, another advisor is going out to do say something similar or create a course, where would they start to look um in terms of finding different tech tools or funky little um, add-ons or plugins. Um, where did you start? Where's the journey? Where does it begin? And where, what's the filtering program? Okay, so I think the best place to start is to actually have a look at what some of the online courses are using themselves. So I did a few online courses and I was looking at what software they were using. Um, there's actually online courses on how to build an online course, ironically. Um, you could also jump onto one of those. Um, they give you all of the platforms. They give you step-by-step -step how to set one up, what the, the layout, the content, um, all of those elements should look like. And I don't usually do things like that. I always like to do stuff by trial and error. So I just did a lot of online research and I read a lot of blogs um, and I went onto a few forums and asked a lot of questions. And I know that there are so many different platforms and you can make it easier on yourself by using something like Teachable or Member Mouse or Kajabi. And they basically have, um, it's almost like a template ready to go and you just plug in the content. So they'll have a theme and you just chuck in the words, you chuck in the video here, you put in a questionnaire and it's like builds it for you as you go. There is a simpler way to do it, but for me, I wanted to create something that I could build on and list, create more courses in the future and have a whole membership area. So I invested a little bit more and decided to do it on a WordPress basis. Uh, do you think that you your choice to do it your way versus the other way was more expensive and, and more time consuming? Like, would you recommend an, 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 like other advisors to do the same thing or would you say go down the other path where everything's set up? <laughs> Is that like a key thing to do that? <laughs> or you, I mean, obviously in, you're in, in hindsight, I should have done, done I, I would, 
you know, I'm a big thing of um, just get something out there. It doesn't have to be perfect. And you can always use it, like create it on Kajabi and then migrate it across to another platform later on. So I would almost, having had my time again, I probably should have just used something like Kajabi to start off with um, and then tested it and measured it, got the feedback and then rolled it over to a, a more comprehensive platform. I think that would have been easier. Although um, it's and, working. And much cheaper. <laughs> okay, so... It's working for me and it's the end result. It's, it's where I want it to be and now I have the ability to create many courses. They have a membership area where they can go in and they can see all of my products. So I've got ebooks, I've got money meditations, I've got um, free challenges and they're all in the one membership site now. So it's kind of like a little member area where they can jump in. And that's part of what I wanted when I first envisaged this. But if anyone's looking at just doing an online course, um, there are much simpler ways to do it and I'd be happy to you know, just hit me up and I'm happy to give you some ideas around what I would use and how I would do it if, if I were doing it your way. Okay, cool. Awesome. Perhaps we can get some of those tips and uh, get them into the, the Facebook group post this, post this session. Um, but cool. So you, you mentioned before the this, you know, for every participant that goes through the course, then somebody else uh, is granted a, a scholarship in the course. Can you just tell us how you choose these people and, and where they come from and what the criteria is around that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we design that for people who, ideally, people who can't afford to do it for whatever reason. Um, there is a full application process and we use social media to promote that the scholarships are open. Uh, we keep a tally of how many scholarships are available and then we open them up at different um, times and allow 10 or 15 participants to come through the program at that time. They generally um, give us a little bit of background on their current situation, what they're hoping to achieve and why they feel that they're um, deserving of the scholarship and then we use that as, as data collection but also as a way to measure impact. So I'm big on understanding um, you know, what is the impact of them going through this program. I don't want to design a program and deliver a program that's just uh, airy-fairy, you know, that was lovely but it was a complete waste of my time and energy. So for me it's really important that I get a clear picture of where they are before they start the journey and then at the end and then I can use that to understand what impact that's having and, and how, you know, how we can start to build better programs in the future. And so how do you how do you measure that and what do you see as the the impact? So my uh, impact measurement is all around mindset and behavioural change. So I'm looking at um, understanding what behavioural mindset issues they have at the beginning, um, what challenges are holding them back from taking action or creating healthier financial habits or even just engaging. And then we measure that along through the program with feedback, um, with different questionnaires, with little habit challenges. And then at the end of it, we also measure at the six week aftermark to see if they've implemented any positive changes in their financial behaviours and um, their financial situation. And what are, you what are you typically seeing as the results and how does that compare for the people that are the, the scholarship the recipients versus the ordinary paid sort of people? You know, it's really funny, um, and I was mentioning it before to you, Ben, but I found that the engagement from the scholarship um, participants has been a much higher level. Um, it's almost because there's, there's a real desire there to undertake the program and they're particularly grateful for the opportunity to go through this program. Um, so their level of engagement in terms of how quickly they're doing the material, I can see what they're logging into, when, how often they're logging into it, what they're completing, how long they're spending on each page. It is much higher for the people that receive a scholarship than it is for people who pay for the program. And I don't know what the psychology is behind that, but I find it really interesting. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I know before um, before we went live, we were just having a quick chat about how many people have gone through your program. So, Lee, you were saying 50 people have gone through and you've had 20 scholarships. Um, what did you do or what particular marketing tools did you use to uh, let people know about the program and, and encourage them to sign up? 
Was there a particular... Uh, Sorry, I was waiting for the noise to go away. Um, so before we um, launched the program, I did a lot of work around building an online community through Instagram and Facebook. Um, and I was doing a lot of workshops face-to-face -face with wellness um, groups and wellness uh, women's collectives and things trying to just build my database because it's all well and good to have an online course but you've got to have a market to sell it to otherwise you're not going to have anyone come through it um, so that was one of the biggest challenges that we faced at the beginning was you know how do I get people to, to know and build and, and why are they going to want to do a course with me if they don't even know who I am so one of the first things we did was launch our free 30-day mindful wealth challenge and that was purely done to build a list and it was really successful. So we're looking at running another free challenge for people, and that's again just going to be a bit of this building exercise. Um, so now we've got around four and a half, just under four and a half thousand people on our email database, which is fantastic. Um, but I want to keep growing that, and I I want to see that grow and grow so that we can start having a bigger audience to to spread that message of financial wellbeing. And so what, Lee, what, if I can just jump in on that one, what was the, uh, the 30 day challenge? What was in, what was involved in, in that? And how did you, was that marketed through your, you know, how did you, how did you market it as well? So the 30 day challenge was, um, basically an email every day with a tip on how to create mindfulness around money. And all it was was about engaging with and becoming more aware of predominantly spending habits, but also buying um, habits, how you're managing money, how you're viewing and thinking about your money. Um, it was just a very simple challenge that we created in MailChimp and automated. Um, and we just we used Instagram mostly as our sign-up mechanism for that. So we did a whole range of um, lifestyle posts which were unrelated specifically to money, but they were about well-being and financial wellness. And we just then just say, why not sign up to our free 30-day challenge? Everywhere I was speaking, I was promoting it. And we just started to get really good sign-up rates. So my lesson from that experience was 30 days is great, but the engagement um, drops off towards the end. So I'm looking at maybe shortening it and having a range of five to seven day challenges instead of 30 day challenges. Awesome. That's a great, great idea and a good way to build traction. Uh, cool. So, yeah. cool. So, so, you've had, so you've had 50 people through um, and you, I, you mentioned when we were chatting just before that these people have come from all over the world and that you've had quite a few from the, from the States. Um, can you just tell us a, yeah, what that sort of breakup has, has looked like, but then also what the, um, what the results have been post the, post the, the, the actual course delivery and, uh, you know, what you do for the, the online course participants afterwards and then you know how many of those you, you're still sort of in contact with yeah, definitely. so the course was always designed as um this global um, audience in mind so when i talk about superannuation for example i'm talking about um planning for retirement or planning for your financial future and i do talk about superannuation but i mentioned um you know other forms of superannuation and retirement things for the uk and the us market specifically and i did that because when i was looking at my instagram following there's a huge market there of um, global audience and I was thinking well this is resonating with everybody it's not just Australian specific and my idea is to create a global business I want to be traveling I want to be location independent so the concept of creating this course I mean the the language around money is universal and what I'm talking about in this course this is specifically around financial well-being is not talking about technical stuff we're not talking and going um, into specifics around tax or investing, but we are talking about general concepts because I've found that a lot of my clients and a lot of the people coming through the program are missing this general basic understanding about money. And I thought, well, okay, how can I create something that resonates with them but also teaches them some of these really great concepts without getting into the real nitty-gritty because 
I find that if you search on Google or YouTube or anything, there is so much stuff on investing and on superannuation or tax. And it's great that that's available and it's freely available, but I think they're also missing that mindset element and the actual fundamental or the foundations of investing and why would you invest and how do you build resilience? So, okay, yes, we're talking about insurance, but it's more around changing the terminology to okay, let's talk about creating financial resilience. How will we do that? We create a savings buffer, we take out insurance, we make sure we've got a good understanding. Um, so those kind of elements to change the language a little bit. Um, in terms of your question around the, the end of the program, at the very end of the six week journey, um, each participant has a free spite session with me. It's only 20 minutes, but it's a way for me to gauge how they enjoyed it whether it was useful to them personally um, and also where they want to go next so that I can point them in the right direction and whether that's an engagement with me as a money coach or as a financial planner or whether it's me pointing them in the direction of another financial planner or a mortgage broker or an accountant um, I just find it as a really good way to then sort of keep them going on their next part of Awesome. And so, and do you end up working with, with many of them on the, the, the financial planning or the financial coaching side of things? Yeah, I do. Um, I would say that nearly 85, maybe 80% of them I'm working with on some level. So um, it might be money coaching, which is around their specific issues that they're having with money. And I'm working with some women in the US, uh, one in India at the moment, um, two in Canada. So that's really exciting. I love working with women all over the world. Um, and then in terms of the financial planning element of it, um, yeah, I'm definitely working with a lot of the participants when they're ready to take that next step. Um, I don't always envisage being able to do that, but at the moment I have the capacity and, and it's, it's enjoyable to see them. Lee, I, was, I might yeah. just jump in quickly and ask, um, uh, are you finding that you're getting uh, a lot of referrals from the people that have completed the course, encouraging other people to complete the course or encouraging other people to take up your services? Is that another way that the message is spreading? And I guess part B to that is do you offer some kind of incentive for that? Uh, for people who are Sorry, what was the second part of the question? Sorry, um, I was going to say, do you provide any kind of referral incentives for people that have completed the course? Um, or people that have so at this stage, um, yeah, the referral rate is fantastic. And I think that's because um, I have a very specific target market and my language appeals to certain types of women. And I think they go through the program, really enjoy it and don't find it daunting or scary. And then they recommend it to their girlfriends or um, to people who are similar to them and similar to me. So the referrals are great. In terms of rewards, we give them access to um, like our eBooks and we give them little free thank yous, um, gratitude things. We also allow them to choose someone to give a scholarship to as well if they want to. Oh, okay. That, that's awesome. Um, yeah. I know you mentioned that uh, you, your target market is obviously women. Um, and women, you know, and you've got quite a heart for women that might not be able to afford financial advice or might not have any. Um, like, um, do you, are you finding though that you've got men interested in doing the course as well, or is this something that has just been purely women? No, it's definitely not just for women. Um, the branding is very feminine, and I've done that specifically, but the message is universal. And mm -hmm. I've had quite a few men come through the programs. Um, they come to my workshops, and they also get a little bit upset when I run retreats that are just for women. Mm -hmm. And I don't do it intentionally. I just find sometimes it's easier to run retreats just for women. But um, I find that there's a lot of men interested in, in what I'm doing. And then men typically in the wellness space. So men who are either yoga teachers or naturopaths, or um, physios, they're doctors. So it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting database and client base to have, definitely. But I would say ninety percent would be women. Yes. Okay. Cool. Well, that's interesting. That's. So I, I've got one, Lee, because I think that that hearing those numbers uh, that you you know working now with 
80, 85% of the people that are, that are going through your course. I think that's actually amazing. Um, can you just say like, what sort of work is it that you're doing with them? What's, is it, it, do you have like a low touch sort of solution that comes off the back of it? Or is this like full coaching or, um, or planning work? And what, yeah, what is the sort of the, that, uh, that those clients comprise of? It's interesting. I offer three different things. We have a quick money session, which is like a $47 chat. They ask me a question, I give them the answer and I give them the point them in the right direction. The next level would be the money coaching, which is a at least three month engagement. We meet once a month. It's a 90 minute Skype or face to face. And then they actually have to go and do some work. So I don't do it for them. I give them the tools and the resources and say, off you go. I'll give you the guidance and I'll help you out, but it's your responsibility to take this step and to do this part of the process. So a lot of that can be around the spending stuff. Um, a lot of the coaching stuff is around mindset towards creating an intentional spending plan, sticking to their spending plan, kind of rewiring habits, that kind of element. Um, and then I also have women who are really well educated, who have the time and the interest to do the financial planning themselves. So it might be they, they're quite interested in consolidating their super and then understanding how to do that themselves. So I just sit with them and say, okay, this is how you choose between superannuation funds. This is, this is the tool that I use, this is the form that I use, this is my knowledge. You're paying for me to educate you how to make your own informed decisions. So I have a whole range of women in that space as well. And then I have obviously the full financial planning side of things, which I'm moving more and more away from. I'm still doing it and I still enjoy it, but I see that being the first thing to go when I get you busy. Interesting. And so what's the split between those four sort of streams? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say it would be around 40% coaching, 40% financial planning, 20% with the just one-off questions at this moment, at this stage. Um, I haven't really promoted the question side of things. It's a model that works really well in the US and we just do a very quick data collection um, so I get a basic understanding of where they're at. It's not product related, it might just be what's a really good app for this or how do I go about this or am I on the right track? It's very generic. It's almost like factual advice. It's not, you don't need a statement of advice for it, obviously. Um, but I'm definitely moving more and more away from full-blown financial planning advice and the advice that I do do, we do it in stages. So I'm doing almost limited advice. Um, so we might do superannuation and we might do insurance and we might do um, cash flow and investment planning, but we do them in chunks rather than a full statement of advice. Okay, and so what, why, why are you going down that path? Why, is it, why are you moving away from the traditional planning? Um, couple of reasons. One, the the time and the compliance around it is huge. And I'm I used to be a real big person about product and investments, but now I'm not. I'm completely around strategy and mindset and behavior because the action is what matters the most. And I say to my clients, it's really important that we get the strategy right. And yes, we'll get the products right, but that's the very last element of what we're going to be talking about. And I've also found that with my clients in the past where I've given them a full statement of advice with you know everything in it, it's been just too overwhelming for them. So my thought process was, okay, let's break it down. Let's make this a long-term relationship. So let's just start with one chunk at a time and we'll start with the most important element, which is usually spending and getting cash flow right. And then we're going to protect that cash flow. So we generally set up some insurance and then we'll look at investing and then we'll look at superannuation. And, and it sort of is like a, a step-by-step -step process or a journey, if you like. Fantastic. Yeah, I think we. Uh, the reason I ask, I'm seeing more people sort of move down that path. But uh, yeah, it's a, uh, the coaching thing does seem to be gaining certainly in, in popularity uh, as well. So was this uh, these like the in terms of the uh, the number of clients that have come through? Is that did you is that what you were planning? Like, did you anticipate that having engaging with that sort of volume of people post the post the, the course? To be honest, no. I wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. Um, 
I would I would like to see it engage with more, but I would like that engagement to be on a one-to-many basis. So I'd love to follow it up with interactive workshops, face-to-face, um, post-program, or I do envisage it to be higher and a I think I mentioned before, I'd like to have a panel of advisors that I go, well, you know, great, you finished the course, I think you should go see this person, or and kind of match them based on maybe location and needs and style of advice and, and that kind of thing. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So I've got I've got a couple of questions from the people watching in, and if anyone else has any questions from Lee, feel free to type them into the chat box on the side here. Uh, we've got a question from from Dylan. Um, so just talking about how you go with these, you know, the, the coaching calls, and I suppose you sort of touched on it there, but in terms of general versus personal advice and, and how that works from a, from a compliance perspective, and perhaps you've obviously spent a lot of time sort of separating out your coaching and, uh, and, and advice, but he, yeah, how, that, how you've gone about doing that and, and what that looks like from a practical point of view. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there is a very fine line, and I've done a lot of research and then spoken to my dealer brief and my, you know, ASIC around what is it. And there's, there's not a lot of clarity around where that line is, so you do have to be very careful. I make sure I give an FSG to everybody, whether they're coaching or financial planning, and I just let them know that when we're doing the coaching, it is, um, it's not specific advice. It's not tailored to them. And as soon as it gets across into the financial planning element, I'll say that I'm like, I can't, I can't do this in this area. If you want that specific advice, we're going to have to almost step aside and it's a different different relationship in a sense. But clients understand the coaching elements. Um, a lot of my clients are used to coaching because they either have a, a health coach or a, um, a business coach or a blogging coach. So they're kind of used to the style. They know that it's um, generally a lot of onerous is on them doing the work rather than me doing the work, which is really, really good. Um, but it is a fine line and you do have to be careful, definitely. And do you get any pushback from clients where they, they're considering going down this coaching relationship where they want you to help them? get the, the results from their money but you're saying that you're not going to give them specific advice and how do you address that? I just let them know that I can do it but it's just going to cost them in a different way, uh, like a different fees, different process and then I actually, I say to them whenever I do anything that's financial planning, I need to give you a statement of advice, I need to put it in writing and make sure that you understand it and that you're fully informed and that you understand what I'm recommending and clients completely get that. I think the clients don't have the issue with it. We have the issue with it. The, the clearer we can get about, um, get it into our, I guess, our heads where that delineation is between coaching and advice, the easier it is. Because I find that clients actually get it really easily. So I've got a, a lady I'm working with at the moment. We're doing a lot of stuff around her money mindset and getting a spending plan in place and just looking at all of that stuff. And the moment that it kind of got into, okay, now I've got some surplus savings, where should I be putting that? I said, that's great, we can do that, but I have to do that as a financial planner, so I have to charge you to do the statement of advice. And she was completely fine with it. So it's all in it's all in our heads. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> uh, uh, cool. Okay, I've got another question here from Ruben, who is asking about like what you what you see as an uh, an average lifetime of your clients. I suppose it might be a little early days with the course being sort of young, but yeah, what do you what do you sort of envision that envision envision that going forward? That's a good question. Um, I think. It's a bit of a journey. So I say to my clients, um, you know, that the initial coaching side is generally three to four months, maybe six months, and then they just contact me and pay for me as they they need advice or support or services. So I sort of say to them, it's not going to be forever, and I don't want it to be forever because I'm hopefully educating them to a point where they are enabled to make everyday financial decisions without me. But when they do need me, they then pay for my support of my services. So the idea is the way that I I communicate it with my clients is initially it will be month to month for as long as you need it. And then it is you pay as and when you need my support and services. So the reason why I've created um, an online course is to start them off 
on their journey in their relationship with me. And then I hope to have additional courses in the future, but I sort of see it being in and out. It's not going to be quite like the traditional financial planning client relationship in my mind. Yes. And what, so what do you see it then looking like? Um, I see it as having a lot more clients, but on a lot, uh, just on a very different basis, not as often perhaps. Or, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, that's a good question. And I, I'm seeing it evolve at the moment. I'm seeing it being quite, um, like I guess like most financial planning relationships, it's quite, um, you know, uh, time consuming at the beginning but then it kind of becomes less and less so as we go on but the coaching that I have been do doing for now the longest client that I've been coaching has been about two and a half years and we probably catch up every two to three months just for a quick um, meeting yeah cool okay and I've got another one here from from Dylan talking about he loves to talk compliance this Dylan uh, but He's asking about, you know, how how your dealer group or license is, uh, you know, how they look at the chunking down advice and that you, you're effectively scoping, you know, everything except the thing that you want to focus on from your advice you know, and in relation to sort of the bid obligations. Yeah, that's an interesting one too. And, you know, I'm not scoping it out forever. I'm just saying at this month, at this point in time, we are just looking at this topic. And the idea is that when I meet with them, we identify all the areas that they do actually need support in. But we only address it at one chunk at a time. So from a compliance point of view, it's just a matter of us in partnership working together the whole elements, but not all at this, you know, immediately. We're just going to do it over the period of time. Yeah, I, I think it's uh, so. How do you with the you where you scope all the things that they need to look at? How do you actually do that? And where does it go if it's not advice? So, with all of mine, we have a start like most and we just sort of work out where they're going and, and I find actually so what we thought at the beginning actually to actually want to achieve um, where they're going you know, I find that their actual reasons for coming to see me changes so we definitely scope it out and we really are going to be addressing this next but quite often something else comes up because life happens and that becomes more important than what we originally were going to address anyway. So it's kind of a loose plan, but then life happens and we do whatever life throws at us along the way. Also, yeah, I know that's something that I experience a lot with, with my clients as well, that people's situation and what's important to them tends to change, you know, pretty, pretty quickly and uh, pretty frequently uh, as well. So, Cool. Okay, a last question I've got here from Amanda, just about how much you're, you charge for, for your coaching, the ongoing coaching. Yeah, sure. So it's 270 a session, um, and that's 90 minutes, Skype or face-to-face, -face, and that includes, um, you know, if there's any worksheets or tools or uh, um, like a follow-up report that I give them via email, just saying this is what we discussed. Um, these are some resources that you might be able to use or here's a template that I suggest that you look at or here's some videos that you should watch. And um, so it's almost like a once-off thing. From my perspective, it's about two hours of my time, an hour and a half with the client and then a half an hour just following up with this is what I think you should do. And I've tried to automate that as much as possible in terms of having, you know, uh, automated emails in a sense. But... It's still personalised, so it can't be fully automated ever. But I do record all of the um, the meetings that we have, and I also record all of my file notes um, just by voice. So I'm sort of getting a bit more efficient in that sense as well. Awesome. And so they just pay when they want to have a session. They just pay the fee, and then that's up to them for the session. That's it. Yeah, so we, I have, um, I asked them to commit to three months at the beginning 
and then it's session by session after that. So three months, um, we've just got to set up as a direct debit. It goes through the licensee, obviously. Um, but if it's coaching, my licensee says that it doesn't have to be through them, but I just do it to keep a record of everything. Um, and then obviously they just pay as and when they need to go on after that. Fantastic. So it's a departure from this retainer retainer type model, um, but interesting to see sort of pay, pay as you go. Fantastic. Okay. Well, Lee, thank you very much. I could, I could talk to you about this stuff for, for days, um, but thank you very much for joining us. Uh, so many awesome ideas there around not only the course, but your approach to advice. And um, yeah, I'm, sh I'm sure the people watching in got some great tips. Um, thank you. Hopefully we can we'll, uh, sum up a couple of those ideas that you mentioned at the start around um, where to go for next steps and maybe get you to share those uh, into the XY Advisor Facebook group. Um, so keep guys keep your eye on there for, for the session. Next week we've got um, we've got Julian Plummer joining us on May the 4th. We, we're going to kindly request that he brings his Star Wars collection onto the webinar. Not sure if he will or not, um, but he will be talking big data. I've asked him to. I've asked okay. him to put uh, Star Wars memorabilia in the background. Whether he does or not is a different story. <laughs> Well, he certainly has enough of it to make that happen. So uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed here. Um, but uh, yeah, jump on there. With, uh, Jackie's just put the, the link to register in the, in the chat box there. So uh, feel free to jump on and register. Um, big thank you again to uh, AIA for, for supporting these sessions. Um, and a massive final thank you to Lee. I hope you haven't made you late for your flight. Thank you. And look, if anyone has any questions, you're always welcome. Please just get in contact. I'm always happy to help and share ideas. Abundance mindset. I love it. Thanks, Thank guys. you, everybody. We'll see you next week.